So we've introduced the idea of rotational motion, rotational position, rotational displacement, angular velocity, angular acceleration. Now we're going to go and try to connect these quantities with the translational quantities, which is important for things like rolling wheels, um, connected body problems where we have pulleys, and any place where translational and rotational motion are happening at the same time. So let's start by connecting um, our position on a circle or a, a rigid uh, disk to uh, our angular and our translational quantities. So for instance, let's say I have some point P and I rotate this disk. Point P is going to move with the disk. The disk is rigid by some angle theta. If I have another point, let's call this Q right here, Q will also move, but it will move a different arc length. P being on the outside of the disk, has a radius from the center of RP, and thus SP is going to be larger than the smaller radius that Q makes. But again, every point on this rigid rotating object has the same angular motion, even though the uh, tangential motion, the linear motion might not be the same, the translational motion might not be the same. So we say here, that the arc length distance that any point will travel is equal to the angular displacement times the distance from the center of rotation. So this connects sort of a linear displacement. I know it's moving along an arc, so that's a little bit different. That's really a distance more than anything else with the angular displacement by some factor, which is simply the radius. What about tangential velocity? We know that a particle traveling around the circle, and as this rotates, point P is going to rotate around the circle, has a velocity which is tangential to its path, tangential to the circular path. So again, S is equal to theta R. So if this point moves some infinitesimal distance along this arc, that's going to be equal to the radius times the infinitesimal angular displacement. So I can come up with an expression for my tangential velocity. The tangential velocity is the uh, infinitesimal amount of distance that I move divided by the infinitesimal time. Now I can say ds is going to be r d theta. r is, is a constant here because the radius doesn't change. p will always be r from the center. And if I take... Uh, ds dt becomes r d theta dt, and we know d theta dt is omega. So I can connect the translational velocity, vt, or just v, with the rotational velocity, the angular velocity, omega, by r. And that makes sense. If I'm at some point close to the axis of rotation, my velocity isn't going to be all that large. As I go further and further away, my radius becomes larger and for the same angular displacement, for the same angular velocity, I'm going to get a larger tangential velocity. Okay, so here that's connecting tangential velocity to angular velocity. What about acceleration? Well, for this point traveling in a circular path, we know that the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, is equal to the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. Okay, so now I can say from our previous example, vt equals r omega, I can plug that in for vt. I get that the centripetal acceleration is r squared omega squared over r. r squared divided by r just becomes r. We keep the omega squared. And here's my expression for centripetal acceleration as a function of omega squared. Let's do one more thing. We know acceleration is dv dt. If we keep our radius constant, we can take out the r from v equals r omega. We just get r is equal to d omega dt. And now we've connected centripetal acceleration to our angular acceleration. Now see the pattern that's going on here? 
all I need to do to go from my angular quantities, my rotational quantities, is to our translational quantities is multiplied by r. In the previous case, I looked at the tangential velocity, how quickly I'm going around in the circular path. I just take my rotational velocity, my angular velocity, and multiply that by r. If I want my centripetal acceleration, my acceleration in the uh, translational direction, I can just simply take r and multiply that by the angular acceleration, okay? Dimensional analysis is important here. Here I have radians per second times meters. Now radians are dimensions. So one over seconds is what my dimensions would be for um, my angular velocity. I didn't say that very well. If I multiply meters times one over seconds, I get meters per second. Do I get the same thing over here? Yes, radians per second squared times meters gives me meters per second squared. Okay, let's look at our centripetal acceleration again. We know our centripetal acceleration is dv dt. Again, there's going to be no radial um, uh, movement, you know, no movement in, in the radial direction here. So I'm not going to talk about speeding up or, or, uh, or slowing down. It's all going to be centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration, yes. Uh, so dv dt, I know that vt is r omega. Again, there's no velocity in the radial direction. So when I take the uh, derivative here, r is just a constant. And our, again, our centripetal acceleration gives us the same thing. But we still have a is equal to r times uh, alpha. From that approach or from this approach, either one works. Okay, so what is an instance where we would connect the two? Well, imagine this wheel is going to rotate. Now we've got to be careful here how this motion is going to, going to happen. We have this angular velocity as it's rotating counterclockwise as this wheel moves forward, okay? Just imagine here, the wheel is rotating this way, and as it does so, it is in contact with the ground, producing a velocity of this point P moving backwards. So in order for the wheel to move forward with some velocity V, its surface has to move backwards this way, okay? So the translational velocity of this wheel, okay? The, the, the overall movement of every particle here is going to be the combined translational velocity here and the rotational velocity around this axis. All right, just watch your wheel sometime. As a wheel rolls forward, if the wheel is going in this direction, it's rotating counterclockwise. If we were to go in the opposite direction, the clockwise direction of the rotation would give me a velocity this way. Okay, so we know V equals dS dt, okay? dS is the uh, infinitesimal amount that I move along the tangential direction, okay? ds dt, we can already say that the radius is constant of this wheel. So the radius can come out. I take d theta dt, and again, I get v equals r omega. So if I were doing this problem and I knew how fast this wheel were rotating, I could use that to find out how quickly the surface was moving with respect to the wheel, and therefore how quickly the wheel was moving or how quickly the velocity of the, the wheel overall. Likewise, if I knew my wheel was accelerating, I could use that to find the acceleration of the wheel. And if this wheel were connected to a car, I could use that acceleration to find out the acceleration of the vehicle, or vice versa, if I knew how fast the car was accelerating, I could use that to find the angular acceleration of the wheel. So A is dV dt. Again, R is constant because our tire is not going flat. That radius is going to be the same. I take d omega dt, and again, I get that same relationship. So these are the same results that we had previously, but I can get the velocity of a rolling object with respect to its angular velocity and the acceleration of a rolling object with respect to its angular acceleration 
by, again, just simply using R to connect the two quantities to one another. Let's do this in actual calculation. The car is traveling 20 meters per second. The wheels of the car have a radius of 40 centimeters. It's about the radius of a tire. What is the angular velocity of these wheels? V equals R omega. I know V. I know R. I want to find omega. So omega is V divided by R. This is important. We can get the angular quantity back by dividing by the radius. V divided by R, 20 divided by 0.4. And I get an angular velocity of 40 radians per second. If I want the frequency of this rotation, I would divide by 2 pi. Okay, to get from angular velocity to angular frequency, it's a factor of two pi. So, you know, if I'm roughly dividing by two pi, which is about six, uh, I don't want to do that in my head, but that would give you your frequency there. Let's do another problem. We're going to get to the these Pauli and, and mass problems later on, but um, a very important part of solving these problems is oftentimes connecting the rate of angular acceleration of the pulley to the mass as it descends here. So what we have happening here is if I have a well and I have a bucket and it's descending, let's say it's descending at three meters per second squared, what is the angular acceleration of my pulley over here? Well, if we think about this, the acceleration here okay of this bucket because it's connected by this line right here this line is going to be tangential this tension is going to be tangential to this so the angular acceleration of this is connected to the acceleration of this by this factor of r so acceleration is equal to r alpha if i want the angular acceleration of this pulley i have to take the acceleration of the bucket which is also the tangential acceleration of my pulley, divided by the radius of the pulley, and I get 15 radians per second squared. And again, going back to what we did earlier with um, constant angular acceleration, um, we can use the kinematic equations to solve similar problems. Um, let's say we have a compact disc, it's, you know, old CD, much like the DVD, and it rotates from rest uh, to an angular speed of uh, 31.4 radians per second. So it's going from zero, omega equals zero, to omega equals 31.4 radians per second. It does this in a time of 0.892 seconds. Find the angular acceleration of the disk. Well, um, final angular velocity is this. Initial angular velocity is zero plus a alpha t, I'm trying to find alpha, t is my time right here. I can reduce this to this. Angular acceleration is omega final divided by t. So 31.4 radians per second divided by 0.892 seconds equals a, an angular acceleration of 35.2 radians per second squared. Now, here's where we connect it to. Through what angle does the disk turn um, during this process. Now I've taken my angular acceleration. I can find the the um, angular displacement based on my initial velocity was zero. So I just take one half alpha t squared. That'll give me how far I've moved in that time, 14.0 radians. But here's the big part. Find the tangential speed of the microbe if it's sitting a distance of 4.45 centimeters from the center. We know the tangential velocity can be connected to the angular velocity. Usually I put R in front of this by just multiplying by R. If I wanna go from angular to tangential, I multiply by R. If I wanna go from tangential to angular, I divide by R. So I have 3.4 radians per second as my final velocity. I want to know how fast it's going uh, at a radius of 4.45 centimeters away, and it's going 1.40 meters per second. So there's an example where we've got to connect tangential velocity and angular velocity. I could do the same thing um, with my 
angular acceleration, I could find my um, centripetal acceleration by taking this figure right here and multiplying it by R. Um, you know, in that particular case, I'd have 35 times about four, four, <laughs> let me try to do that. Actually, it's 0 0.04, so I got to be careful how I do this. It would have, um, you know, an angular acceleration of about 0.4 radians per second squared. But you could do that connection, connecting um, angular acceleration and centripetal acceleration. 